Good morning to everybody in Beijing. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, I know it's early for the weekend, so I think it will take a while to have people slowly uh, join us. Um, but I would like to begin by uh, welcoming those that are new to this. Uh, we've been having professors join us from Yale every week. Uh, and today we are very honored to have, I think, our first uh, science uh, talk of the summer. Uh, and I will confess that uh, as a non-science major, uh, this will be uh, more of a challenge than before <laughs> for me to uh, engage in this conversation, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, luckily, today is a good cross between, uh, I guess you could say, philosophy and, and astronomy. So uh, I'd like to begin by introducing Yale Center Beijing for those of you that are new to us. Uh, we were established in 2014 as a gathering place for leaders in, from Yale, China, and across the world uh, to, to come and to share from their fields of studies. Uh, and our, uh, as I've mentioned, our activities range across the fields. Um, we're lucky to have today uh, Professor uh, Natarajan from astronomy, but we also do medicine, philosophy, music, economics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of course, we are very lucky um, to be able to do this on Zoom. And we've tried to get uh, uh, Professor Natarajan to come to Beijing in the past, and we finally got her, even though it's on online, um, but it should be a good summer. Uh, a quick introduction. Um, to Professor Nadarajan. Uh, she is the Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics uh, at Yale, a very popular lecturer and teacher. Uh, she has multiple degrees from MIT as well as doing graduate work in Cambridge. Uh, she's a theoretic, theoretical astrophysicist interested in cosmology, uh, gravitational lensing, as well as black hole physics, which I know uh, has been a pretty popular topic as of late. Uh, her research and original contributions to the study of dark matter and dark energy and black holes has won her many prestigious awards and honors, including election to the Fellowship of the American Physical Society, as well as Guggenheim and Radcliffe Fellowships. Uh, at Yale, she has served as both the Director of Undergraduate Studies as well as Director of Graduate Studies at the Astronomy Department, and she has also been the Chair of the Women's Faculty Forum. Outside of Yale, uh, she serves on the National Astronomy and Astrophysics Advisory Committee that advises NASA, as well as chairs the Division of Astrophysics for the American Physical Society. Uh, her book, which we uh, in our uh, event promo featured, Mapping the Heavens, the Radical Scientific Ideas that Reveal the Cosmos, combines her interests in astronomy as well as cosmology. And today we're very lucky to have her share from her book about the latest discoveries in astronomy, what we now know, what we don't know, and what the future looks like. And so uh, without further ado, here is Professor Nadarajan. Hi, Devin. Uh, hi, everyone. I just wanted to say hello. And uh, I'm utterly delighted to be invited. Uh, as Devin said, um, I actually love China. I've only been there twice, only to Shanghai. And I was really hoping to come in person to do this. But I guess we will have to do with Zoom for now. But um, I, um, I let me get started a little bit. Let me just make sure that the screen sharing works uh, smoothly. I think uh, there should be no issues at all. Okay. Um, can everyone, um, is, does this look good? Can everyone see it? I think my screen works, right? Yeah, looks good. Okay. Okay, great. So um, what I, um, um, also uh, Devin, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, so I think what I would like to talk about and share with you all today um, is the sort of the excitement in terms of the radical new ideas in cosmology that really have taken off in a spectacular way in the last hundred years. And um, in, in the book itself, I focus on sort of eight big ideas and I talk a little bit about the history of the idea and also the developing scientific sophistication. As you all know, science progresses as we get more and more data, get more evidence, then we our theories and our understanding deepens and it gets, um, 
sharper. Our understanding gets much, much sharper. But along the way, there's some wrong turns, there are some setbacks, uh, at the same time, there are some very unexpected serendipitous events that happen. So as you all know, science is sort of a mixture of all of these things. You know, it's a very creative process like any other creative process. And um, scientists are really driven by their passions. So although the scientific material that we deal with and we wanna look at it objectively, it is a subjective enterprise because we all have our motivations for why we are doing what we are doing. And you know, there's also a human and a psychological si side of science. So as scientists, we are all trained to be open-minded because you, know, you always have to be open to new ideas. But yet, when a radical new idea is proposed, if it really disorients us in some way, and I'll be talking about those kinds of really dramatic transformational ideas about our cosmos, then even scientists who are trained to be open-minded sometimes, you know, resist those ideas and don't accept them right away. So I am also interested, aside from the science and the ideas itself, I'm interested in that process, that process of how scientific ideas get accepted. And because I think in the case of cosmology, it's been a very interesting um, convergence of ideas and instruments and computational power that have really helped us understand the cosmos as, um, as, as it is now. And I personally am very interested in maps uh, because you know, mapping is the way of knowing and it has been in astronomy because we can never, unlike biology or chemistry, where you can manipulate a specimen in a test tube or under your microscope, the universe is just what there is. It is what is out there you know, a supernova goes off here, we cannot make it go back again the next day at a different place and study it. So it's a very different, so it's a very peculiar science. And as Devin mentioned, one of the interesting things about cosmology is it also it borders on philosophy because it borders on some of the deepest questions. Why are we here? And are we alone? And also, as you will see, how come with the brain the size of a cantaloupe in our heads, we have figured so much out about the universe. So I think first I want to show you how we have grown, how cartography, cartography of the earth and the sky has propelled astronomy and cosmology in the ways that it has and how ultimately even today, people like me, we are cosmic explorers who are trying to redraw the map, draw a more and more accurate map as time goes on as we get better data. So I wanna start, uh, so this is a, just a brief outline. As I said, one of the um, key issues that I'm interested in other, from, other than showing you some of the exciting ideas in the science is you know, how science works. And these are sort of case studies that give you a flavor for how science progresses. And as I mentioned, the sort of the human side, the psychological side of science, because we are human, scientists are human and it's a human endeavor. And this process of a radical um, new idea, how it moves from just a first proposal to acceptance is very interesting. And as you'll see, I will be using maps as a way to discuss some of the most powerful new ideas in mapping dark matter, in uh, mapping black holes. And then I also will talk a little bit, you know, it would be part of the story uh, of the resistance to new ideas and how that was overcome. And so I will be doing sort of two case studies. So I'll show you, I'll take you on a journey to show you two big radical ideas about the universe. Uh, that is the notion of dark matter and black holes and how, how those ideas that uh, moved from being first proposed to now being a key portion of our understanding of the cosmos. So I wanna start with what is known as the Nebra sky disk. It is, we believe, the oldest depiction of the night sky. So this dates to 2000 to 1600 BCE. So this was, uh, we believe that this is the sun, of course, the crescent moon, and the star cluster Pleiades. And what we think, this was uh, found, it was excavated, it's a copper disk. It was excavated in the Saxony Anhalt region of Germany. And it turns out that we can now calculate, and we know it's the Pleiades cluster, because when we back calculate, we know that was visible from Germany at that time. 
So this is an old map uh, of, as I told you, the cartography of, of the land and the uh, sky mirrored each other. And so this is the standard, you know, so the Indians and the Chinese were mapping the, uh, the, um, mapping the skies, mapping the earth. Not as many records have survived of all the work that we did. What really happened is the knowledge from our cultures, especially China and India, was adopted by the travelers. So many Greeks who came to our shores, to Indian shores, and then traveled up and then along this, the so-called Silk Route, you know, well before it was called the Silk Route, there was exchange of information. So the technologies that were developed in China, the magnetic compass was discovered there, was invented there. It was adopted by the Europeans when they started navigating and doing the voyages of exploration. Similarly, the mathematics, spherical trigonometry, was the invention of the Indians and the Arabs. And then the Greeks adopted that they took that knowledge and then they used it for exploration. So, you know, a lot of our artifacts have gone, but the later maps that were inspired by all the work that our cultures did has survived. So for example, you see here, it's a map Ptolemy's idea of the world. So this is the world. And, um, you know, you can see, you know, our, you can see China, India kind of appearing vaguely in these maps. This is sort of what they knew. This is 200 AD. Of course, our civilizations were much older, but this is what they knew, right? So this, is tell you, this tells you that a map is always incomplete. There are always things you don't know. And, but the good thing about these old maps is that they acknowledge that you didn't know. So if you see a lot of old maps, they would say terra incognita means we don't know what is there. So, <clears throat> so some of the more uh, sort of maps that have driven um, the, the conception of cosmos came from maps of the world, the idea of the globe, and we use the same projection to draw the map of the sky. So one of the early maps is this Orbis Terrarum, which is from 1594. And you can see, I kind of show this as a contrast to a medieval world map with this Al Idrisi's map. So I want you to see that how over time, as we know more, as the more of the world was explored, you can start seeing all the continents come into view. There's a reason I'm showing this to you as an analogy. You will see that when I show you a map of dark matter, this is exactly what happens. You first have a very fundamental rudimentary view, a simplified view. As you know more, you can map much better and in much greater detail. So you'll see that there's a real difference in the level of detail. And that comes from more knowledge, from just knowing more. So let's move now. We've now looked at maps of the earth. Well, let's jump into maps of the sky. So this is one of the early maps. And the reason I'm showing this is that in this map, you see the first transition to a kind of questioning about the cosmos for the first time. So this is a map of our conception of the sky, the earth, the night sky, the moon. And this is the first time you see these two angels that are turning the crank. So this is the first time the question arose, why do we have night and day? Why do we have seasons? And this why was a different kind of why. They wanted an explanation. So an explanation like what we now believe is a scientific explanation. So this is the first evidence that that kind of question was asked. And so then there are some very interesting maps. So this is one of my favorites. So I couldn't resist showing you this one. It's called the Catalan Atlas. It's from Abraham Kresge's and it's from 1375. And what is interesting about this map is that notice the four corners. You now see an astrolabe, an instrument appearing. So that is showing you that knowledge is now going to be quantitative knowledge. We're going to make measurements with an instrument and that is going to inform our view of the cosmos. So it's a major transition. Intellectually, it's a big leap that we are moving just from imagination 
to actual real knowledge where you know the explorers were um, uh, uh, exploring new lands as we saw but here you know the night sky was mapped with some conception and then now they realized they can make measurements why is this important this at this point humans realize that the cosmos was ordered there was order and therefore it could be measured and that's fundamental to the development of uh, cosmology these are just some other fun maps that i have which are so let's move to our conception of cosmos and the fundamental reshaping of the cosmic view. And that happened in 1543 with Copernicus, as you all know, where basically Copernicus reordered the cosmos. I keep saying cosmos, but remember till about 1919, the cosmos, our idea of cosmos was just the solar system. We did not know about another, any other galaxies. It was only in 1919, that astronomers, the astronomer Edwin Hubble, looked through a telescope that allowed us to see the next nearby galaxy. We saw other galaxies as little fuzzy things in the night sky, but we didn't know what they were. The only cosmos we knew till the 1900s was our solar system. So even there, as you know, Copernicus reordered the, uh, the solar system, put sun at the center, and put the earth and the moon and all the other planets as revolving around the sun. So this was the first major intellectual shift in our cosmic view in terms of the solar system. But that was a very difficult idea. It was a very radical idea. So there was pushback to that idea. So the one pushback, which is very interesting because it gets mapped so we can see, you know, unlike today, right, we won't see, we don't see books, we don't see TV programs that are contesting and debating the Copernican idea. But what we see is this map where it's sort of a halfway model. So the halfwayness is the earth is still the center, unlike Copernicus conception, which is the truth now we know. And the sun is going around the earth, but all the other planets are going around the sun. So it's sort of halfway, a little bit, you know, the earth is still the center, like, you know, it was reassuring, right? Because that was really uh, uh, disorienting to people. So there we go. So 1919, everything bursts open. Of course, in 1600, Galileo invents a telescope. It's a spyglass that he points now towards the night sky rather than on the ground. And the whole cosmos gets open to the telescope. So Till then, it was naked eye astronomy. After that, we started having instruments, started having better and better instruments. So now we have fantastic instruments, both on the ground telescopes as well as observatories in space. So here you see our current conception of cosmos. It's no longer the solar system. We know about the entire universe. We know that the universe started in the Big Bang. We know that it expanded very rapidly early on. We know there was a period before the first stars formed, the night sky was dark, eventually galaxies, stars, planets, everything formed. And we also know how long this entire thing, this whole sequence of events took 13.8 billion years. So we have nailed the timeline, we've nailed the sequence, but there are still many big questions open. So that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about. Some of the two of the big open questions. So one thing we know very well are the contents of the universe. So we know the inventory, the budget of what co the contributions of various components are. We know that the majority of our universe is made of this component called dark energy. That is 72% of the pie. Then the rest of it is matter, but most of the matter is actually the green part of the pie is actually a peculiar exotic kind of matter. It's not the stuff that we are made of. It's not ordinary atoms. Ordinary atoms are only about 5%, 4.6%. Everything in the periodic table, all the stuff that we are made of is a mere 5% of the universe. And most of the matter in the universe is not this stuff. It is actually uh, some exotic thing that is called a dark matter. Okay, what else do we know? We also know from Einstein's theory of general relativity, that was what was profound about his theory, that the contents, so whatever the constituents of the universe are, 
the geometry, that is the shape of the universe, and the fate of the universe are completely interlinked. So if you know two of them, if you know the contents of the universe and you know the shape of space, then you can predict the fate, the future of space, the future of the universe. And why is the future a question? Because the universe is expanding. We know that the universe has been expanding. It expanded very rapidly early on, but it, continue, it slowed down, but it still continues to expand even today. And in fact, in 1998, as recently as 1998, we actually discovered that the expansion of the universe, it was not just a constant expansion, but it was an accelerated expansion. So that's a brand new thing we discovered about the universe not so long ago. But what we do know is that these three quantities are interlinked. And so our goal in cosmology is to figure out any two of these components because that then can tell us what the third thing is. Now, what was so special? Why does the shape of space matter? You might wonder, okay, why does the shape of space, the shape of universe, how does it matter? It turns out that the shape of space is intricately linked to gravity. And gravity is the force that shapes the cosmos. It's the dominant force that holds everything together in the cosmos. All other forces of nature are very, very weak on such large scales. The distances that are relevant in astronomy are huge. And the only force that can really act effectively over these large distances is gravity. So, and gravity is much more fundamental in how it structures the universe. So for example, we conceive of the universe as a sheet, a sheet that is four dimensional, four dimensions because three of space and one of time. And what the way gravity and space and the cosmos interact is that any, anything, any object in the cosmos like the sun that has mass, that has gravity, what it does is it causes a little pothole in the sheet of space, okay? And the bigger, the more compact, the more massive an object is, the deeper the pothole. And that's what I mean that the universe is shaped. So basically our universe is a sheet that is pockmarked. It is pockmarked with a lot of potholes because of the matter in our universe. And the equations, Einstein's equations that I just told you interlink the contents, the shape, and the fate of the universe, they have only three possible solutions. There are only three permitted solutions. And so the goal in cosmology has been to figure out, obviously, which of these three solutions corresponds to our universe, right? So we want to see which track, which solution is our universe on. And what do I mean by track? The expansion history, the future, what is the projected future of our universe, right? And so the geometries for our universe, the three possible solutions are a closed geometry, like, the, like a sphere, a flat geometry, like flat space, and an open geometry, like a saddle on a, if you sit on a horse, you know, the saddle, that shape. And so the ideas, sort of some of the really radical ideas that have reshaped our understanding in cosmology have to do with, as I said, the, the discovery of the expansion of the universe, the discovery of this accelerating expansion, which we believe is caused by some mysterious thing called dark energy. We don't know what it is. And I just told you that the matter content of the universe is dominated by dark matter. Once again, we know what dark matter does. We don't know what it is. And then we also know that there are black holes in the universe. They are littered everywhere in the universe. And uh, we don't, we, once again, we cannot directly image a black hole like we can image the sun or any other galaxy. We only see dark matter and black holes indirectly. And so I will talk a little bit more about these four radical ideas and how we have come to understand them. So first, this is, uh, this is a picture of the astronomer Edwin Hubble, who is sitting 
at the uh, telescope in Mount Wilson in California. This is from the early 1900s. And this is the discovery of the Andromeda galaxy. This is a galaxy that is our closest galaxy. And he was able to identify by measuring the distance to Andromeda, he was able to, uh, to infer that it was an external galaxy. It lies outside our galaxy, the Milky Way. And therefore we discovered the first other galaxy in the universe. And then of course, from then on, it has exploded. And now we know there are billions and billions of galaxies in the universe. So this is just to show you how simple the actual discovery was. This is the graph from his scientific paper. And what he found, uh, what he found was something quite um, uh, profound again, which is that the farther away he discovered all these galaxies, other galaxies in the universe, and he found that all the galaxies were moving away from us very fast, and they moved faster if they were farther away from us. And it's called the Hubble law. So this is one of the fundamental discoveries in cosmology that has really allowed us to make sense of how the galaxies in the universe are held. What holds them? Why are they flying apart? What, what causes them to fly apart? And so what is really happening is that space itself is expanding. So this is sort of my, uh, my attempt to show you a simple version of that. So if you can imagine space to be a grid, what, is that? what do I mean when I say the universe is expanding? I mean that the grid itself is stretching. The grid on which galaxies exist and live, that is, exist, uh, that is uh, expanding. And so we know that because the universe is expanding, we also know that the universe has a finite age. I told you that it's 13.8 billion years old. And we also know that the speed of light is finite. So there is only a portion of the universe that is currently visible to us. We don't see the entire universe. Why? Because we can only see the portion from which light has had time to reach us. And that's the portion, that's the observable universe. That's the universe from which we get all the data that I'm going to now continue showing you. Um, showing you. So I just wanted to give you a few, few basics to kind of get you oriented about cosmology and some of the key ideas before I delve a little deeper. So then in 1998, as I mentioned, we discovered not only like Hubble's law that the universe was expanding, but that the expansion was actually accelerating. And this was found in 1998. Notice 19, very recent. So we are still making major discoveries about the universe today. And you might be all wondering that, you know, every other day you see in the newspapers, right, there's some new astronomical discovery. It really is a golden age for cosmology and astronomy right now. We are making a lot of discoveries. So this is just to show you, this is just a cartoon kind of image that shows you what is the fate of a universe that is not just expanding at a constant rate, but there is accelerated expansion. And so you all know from your experience of sitting in a car or any vehicle, right? In order for the acceleration, if you press the acceleration on the car to accelerate, you have to press, that, um, press the button and you use fuel. Some energy is needed to accelerate, right? And so just in the same way, to drive the universe into accelerated expansion, you need energy. And we think that that energy is dark energy. We don't know what that, what that energy is, but we know what it does. It causes the accelerated expansion of the universe. So as I told you, there are many fates for the universe. Now with dark energy in the picture, we can see what an accelerating universe might look like in the past, present, and future. And so if the, I show you a line where it is to, uh, the time today is marked, and so the goal in cosmology has been to try and figure out which of these cosmological models corresponds, is a good description of our world, our universe. So I, you know, there are some exciting new developments for those of you who are science nerds like me. I thought I'd throw out a word or two so you can go and Google and learn a bit more about. Um, so there's a little crisis and in cosmology, we often have little crises. 
there's, you know, there is data and there's theory and they don't match up. And then you have to figure out why that is so. So I think there is a crisis uh, now in um, understanding and interpreting this uh, Hubble expansion and dark energy. So now let me move on to uh, dark matter. So um, the discovery of dark matter um, was actually in the 1970s and it was detected directly from data. So it was not theoretically predicted, it was actually detected empirically from observational data. So let me talk about, there are different ways, there have been many different ways of detecting dark matter. And so I'll lead you through the evidence for dark matter. And even though we don't see it, I'm gonna to try to convince you that it is real. We are very sure that it's real because there are many independent ways, and I'm just showing you little sort of you know, little peeps into what those independent ways are to detect uh, that have shown us that there is a huge amount of dark matter. So the first evidence for dark matter came from, the evidence came in the 1930s, but it wasn't clear, it wasn't obvious what was going on. So what was going on is this is um, an object, a cosmic object called a cluster of galaxies. So it's about a thousand galaxies that are somehow held together in unison. They seem to be held by gravity, right? So this is a picture um, of um, the astronomer um, Fritz Zwicky. He was a cantankerous guy, as you can see. He was kind of arrogant. He was very smart, but he was not very liked. But he was bright and he made, so what he did is he measured the speeds of about 12 galaxies in this cluster, this cluster that is held together. And he found that they were moving around so fast that there is no way that the gravity of the stars that you see was enough to hold them together. That there had to be something else that was preventing them from flying off because they were moving so fast. And that's when he proposed that there is some unseen matter that is providing um, the gravitational glue to hold these galaxies together. But you know, nobody believed him. He wrote the paper, so we have to give him credit, but everyone thought this was crazy, right? Then in 1937, he didn't give up the idea. Einstein's theory of general relativity predicts that the presence of matter will deflect light, will deflect the path of light. The reason, now you all know, that the universe is actually a sheet. And so if the presence of matter is going to cause potholes, then light from galaxies has to go in and out of potholes, right? And just as the tires of our car carry the imprint of every pothole that we've been up and down, the shock absorbers tell you, the light from distant galaxies gets bent and that can be measured. So he said, you know, Einstein predicted that effect. He said, well, if there is dark matter here, we should be able to measure the deflections. But sadly for him at the time, these deflections are so tiny and there were no telescopes available that were large enough for those deflections to be measured. People forgot about it. This is it. So no one uh, took him seriously and that was that. Then it took another 40 years. In the 1970s, Vera Rubin and her collaborators, they started finding a very peculiar phenomenon. So they were measuring the motions of stars in an individual galaxy, in a spiral galaxy, nearby spiral galaxies. They were measuring the speed from the center outward. And what you expect, because you, know, you see the light, the galaxy ends, right? And, it's, and that's the edge of the galaxy. What you expect is the red curve for the speeds, that the stars are moving, they're moving faster, and then the galaxy ends, there's no gravity, they're held together by the gravity of the galaxy, and then the galaxy ends and you see the red curve. But what they measured was the white curve, and that is very peculiar. It seems to suggest, literally, there is, there is something that is holding up the galaxy in the outskirts, right? This is the speed of stars on the y-axis, and as a function of distance from the center, and suddenly it seems like the speeds of stars are being held constant. And that tells you there's a lot of unseen matter that is providing gravity literally to hold up the galaxy 
beyond where you see the light, even beyond where you see the light. And so this is just to show you once again, those measurements and, um, and, you know, and it's not just one galaxy. It is actually seen in many, many galaxies. And now we know pretty much every galaxy has a huge amount of dark matter. We call it a dark matter halo, dark matter distributed all the way from the center to the outskirts of the galaxy. And the reason this distribution is interesting and peculiar is that just for comparison, look at the solar system. Look at the speeds of the planets in the solar system, right? So the sun is the most massive body in the solar system. That is the source of gravity. And so as you go further out from the sun, the planets are moving slower and slower. Why? Because gravity falls off as one over the distance square. This is Newton's law, right? So the gravity is getting weaker and weaker. So these objects, Uranus, Saturn, and Neptune are moving slower and slower. Notice that in a galaxy, you see the opposite. Why? Because there is stuff, there is matter that is distributed all the way to the outskirts. Unlike the solar system, where all the matter is sitting right only at the center, we have galaxies are completely different. <clears throat> so the other, other proof for the existence of dark matter in galaxies and in the universe comes from this bending of light that I've just finished telling you. This is a very nice schematic that allows you to think about it. So you have a cluster of galaxies, which are these thousand galaxies that are shown as dots. They cause a big pothole in space time in the, in the grid, you can see. So if you have light from a distant galaxy that comes to us, towards us in Earth, it gets bent. And so what you end up seeing are you don't see the real shapes of galaxies once they are lensed. You see the distorted shape. So you see the stretched out shape that you see in my animation. So our conception of a galaxy is the gray thing that you see, that's the dark matter, and you see only the tip of the iceberg of a galaxy. What you see is a very small portion of the galaxy. So this is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope, and you can see a deformed lensed galaxy that is bent out of shape because of the gravity of unseen dark matter that is sitting there. And you see this, you know, the Hubble has seen many such distorted galaxies. One other effect that we have is that not only is the light from a galaxy deflected, occasionally, if the bending is very strong, the image actually gets split into multiple. So, so you see many multiple copies of the same galaxy. So in reality, there is only one galaxy, but we see five copies in this case. And how do we know there are five copies? Because remember, every object in the universe has a fingerprint. It has a spectrum. It's called a spectrum. And so we go out and we measure. It's the energy that comes out as a function of wavelength. And so you go and measure these and you see they are identical. So they are the same object that is mirrored, right, into multiples. So we see that. And so I want to move on to show you here is a Hubble Space Telescope image. And on the right, where you see just the galaxies, it's a beautiful image. Um, you know, my screen cannot capture all the detail when I'm showing it to you right now. But what is shown on the right-hand side is the map of dark matter that we created. We figured out this is in blue, is the unseen dark matter that is actually causing all the deflections that we actually see. So we see these deflections, so we know there's dark matter. We can then figure out from the patterns of deflections where the dark matter is and map it. And that's what we've done there. And this is a case where I'm showing you, this is another map of dark matter that me and my research group made. And here I have visualized the dark matter as lumps. So you can see them as little mountains. So these are the lumps of dark matter that are in that region. That yellow region is what I'm showing you on this uh, on the right hand side. So dark matter in the universe, as you'll see all these lumps, it is distributed pretty much everywhere, but it is clustered and it is lumped and clumped in some regions. You see a lot of clumping and aggregation in some regions, like the region that I've marked with the yellow circle. So this is the latest data, the latest and the best from Hubble, the deepest image. And this is 
the deepest um, dark matter map that we have at present. And this is showing you in terms of those lumps and clumps. So this is, it, to date, it's the deepest map that we have of dark matter that shows you the smallest lumps, the hills and the valleys. And so this is a simulation, a theoretical understanding of dark matter. And we know that, as I said, you know, dark matter is everywhere. We can simulate how dark matter will evolve over the age of the universe. And we now know that dark matter is what shapes and forms galaxies. So this is a simulation of dark matter. And the yellow bits that you see are the regions where galaxies will form. Dark matter, matter is all the purple filaments. And where the filaments intersect, you have dark matter lumps like the peaks and the mountains I showed you. Those are the places where galaxies end up forming in the universe. And so <clears throat> we know this very well, we understand it. And I'm just gonna show you some simulations that are fun just to show you the movies to give you a sense of what all we know about how galaxies form at the present time. We understand quite a lot about how galaxies form, how stars form, and how dark matter actually shapes the entire universe. So it's like the unseen dark force that is not visible, but it is the conductor that makes everything happen in the universe in the universe that we actually see in the visible universe. So it has very peculiar properties, this dark matter. We know it's collisionless. What do I mean by collisionless? So remember, in, um, in, with ordinary matter, if you have two molecules, they will actually collide and crash against each other. Dark matter is made of some peculiar article from the early universe that it actually never collides. They just kind of go past each other without colliding. So they're collisionless. That's a very peculiar property. They're very cold. They move very slowly in the universe. They're very weakly interacting in the universe. And so the leading candidate for dark matter is the weakly interacting massive particle. They're called WIMPs. And there is another possibility, and those are called axions. And you might have just seen in the newspaper yesterday that maybe we have detected one of them. I am keeping my fingers crossed. I am not sure it's an actual discovery yet. We'll have to wait and see. But um, you know, this is a very, very active field of research. So let me quickly move on to <clears throat> showing you a little bit about how black holes became real. And you all know that last year, this is an image that you all saw. You could not have escaped. This is the closest the, the map of a black hole of light around a black hole. The black hole itself does not emit light as we will see in a minute, but the light that grazes right around the black hole, we were able to image that for a nearby galaxy by the Event Horizon Telescope. So when I started writing, this, uh, writing the book, I was very puzzled. I was looking into the idea of the history of the word black hole. And it was very interesting. It had something to do with India. I never knew it. It had to do with the prison in India that you know, an Indian king had imprisoned British soldiers inside this prison. And most of them, it was a small prison and they died. So a black hole was a place of no return. Like you don't come back out alive. So the astronomers, you know, black holes were not known at this time. We didn't know about black holes till Einstein came along. 1915 is when we knew about mathematically the idea of a black hole. And so it was very peculiar that this idea, the word black hole, which means exactly what the scientific object, astronomical object is, predates the object, the discovery of the object. So coming back to gravity and the shape of space. What are black holes? So black holes are basically intense, <clears throat> intense, dense bits of matter that are so intense that they don't just create a pothole in space-time, but they create a puncture in space-time. They actually puncture space-time very dramatically, right? So they are very, very dense objects. They are so dense that not even light can escape a black hole. But black holes have a very interesting property. They have this region called the event horizon. And that 
that is a region of no return. So even if light crosses into the event horizon, it gets captured. However, light that is circling around farther out will keep orbiting forever. And remember, that light that orbits forever is what the event horizon telescope people mapped here. That was what was mapped. It was the light that is orbiting at a distance that is not captured. That is what was mapped a couple of years ago. And where do black holes live? So it turns out that every galaxy in the universe, including our own, has a supermassive black hole in the center. So that was real data. Now we are moving to an artist's impression because we can never get this close into any galaxy, right? So this is the black hole that is sitting in the center of um, a galaxy. And there is a disk of gas. The red stuff is the disk of gas that is feeding the gas hole, uh, the black hole that is being pulled into, the gas is being pulled into the black hole. And as the gas is falling in, it is getting hotter and hotter and it starts to glow. And that's what we see. That's how we see a black hole. We don't actually see the hole itself but we see the light that is falling in, the matter that is falling in, that is getting heated and emitting light as it's falling in. And so these are real objects in the universe and they are called quasars. So a quasar is a, is a black hole that is actually feeding gas from which we can see the light from the outskirts. So black holes appear in two modes. They are either feasting, so they're feeding gas and we see them, or they're fasting. There's no gas around them and we don't really see them at all. They are just silently sitting there. So the black hole in the center of the Milky Way, our own galaxy is a million times the mass of the sun, right? And we actually know about black holes, more distant black holes that are a billion times the mass of the sun that are, that are there in, massive galaxies, bright galaxies, and quasars are so bright, feasting black holes are so bright that they outshine the whole galaxy. So uh, right here, I'm showing you a galaxy, a spiral galaxy with the quasar, and you, in the left-hand side, you see the quasar that is shining really bright. And in the right-hand side image, I've removed the light of the quasar. Only then you can actually see the galaxy. I mean, it's the same I'm talk, I mean, it's the same point in the universe. It's the same image. I've just removed the quasar on the right-hand side. And suddenly you can see the galaxy that the black hole is sitting in, right? So I want to show you that the evidence for the existence of the black hole in the center of the Milky Way is extremely strong. So this is real data, and you see time, uh, the years. So these are the orbits of the stars right around the black hole of the Milky Way. And what you just see in red was a gas blob that came nearby the Milky Way. And we were hoping that it would get gobbled completely, but it didn't. It went past and it's gonna come back. So what you see now are predictions for the future of what's going to happen. Um, so, but this is real data, it's spectacular. And I do I just want to remind you that this was the Event Horizon Telescope image results that we saw where they did something very clever they leveraged radio telescopes on the surface of the Earth so that the entire surface of the Earth would behave like a telescope. And, uh, you know, I was not part of the collaboration, but they are uh, friends. They're very, I was very supportive. And I went to the celebration when they announced the scientific result in Washington, D.C. So the question you might ask is how do black holes grow? And we think black holes grow in a bunch of ways. I just told you by gobbling gas from a disk of gas that is sitting around them. And they also grow when two galaxies that have black holes crash into each other. And they both have black holes in the center. And this is a movie that I'm showing you from a simulation from my PhD student's thesis work, where you see two spiral galaxies that have a lot of gas and they have a flickering center because that's a growing black hole that you see flickering. And then they collide. It's a very dramatic, violent collision and the end you will have one big galaxy, bright galaxy, and one big black hole that is formed from the collision of those two black holes. So what is very exciting about the collision of these two black holes is that now we can simulate 
how supermassive black holes will collide. So these are all to show you simulations of what happens when two black holes crash. The interesting thing is that when any time two black holes crash, even if they are tiny black holes or big black holes, they cause an earthquake in space. They shake up space. They set up gravitational waves. And so that was detected recently, again, a few years ago by the LIGO collaboration. They detected the collision of tiny black holes. They are piddly black holes compared to the ones that I am interested in. They detected the collision of black holes that were 30, 40, 50 times the mass of the sun. And the black holes that I have been showing you and talking about are supermassive black holes that are a million, 10 million, 100 million, billion times the mass of the sun. When they crash, they will shake up space in a major way. We just don't have the instruments yet to detect that. It's at a very low frequency and it is coming. And what I show you in a little cartoon here is the planned satellite in space. And that's called LISA. And that should be able to detect. Um, it's a European satellite that uh, should go up in the 2030s and we should be able to detect. So I should stop here and I just want to close. If you wanna learn a little bit more about sort of many other puzzling mysteries that are around black holes, there's a Scientific American article that, um, that I wrote in a special issue and you will find more information on you know, what are the future prospects? What are the new exciting discoveries that are coming along in the next 20, 50 years? So uh, thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to all your questions. Thank you. Thank you, that was amazing. Uh, um, yeah. But um, I will also add that in addition to the article that uh, Professor just mentioned, uh, we will actually be inviting Professor back for a weekend seminar uh, the first weekend of August. So that'll be August 1st and 2nd. And that will be another incredible opportunity for everybody to learn even more detailed uh, about what exactly um, we know and don't know and um, what, what uh, sort of is on the future horizon for, for these studies. So uh, we'll be announcing that the details of that program very soon. So keep uh, those of you that are on WeChat, uh, keep, keep posted on WeChat and it's an incredible opportunity to learn truly from one of the, the most exciting uh, professors that we have at Yale. Um, so we're gonna move into a time of Q &A. Uh, and A. Yeah. And so the way this works is uh, on the bottom of your screen, there is both a chat button as well as a participants button. Uh, we ask that you either enter your question into the chat or raise your hand uh, on the participants uh, button and then we will call on you so that you can ask your question and interact directly with the professor. Um, and we do ask that if you are asking a question, if possible, that you please turn on your camera just so that we can have, uh, it's always good to just have some interaction with, with people yeah. who are actually talking to you. Um, so that would be most helpful. Um, and so, yeah, we're lucky to have a time to ask some questions now um, and then look out for details for the August um, course as well. Uh, so in the group chat, somebody asked a question already. Um, Hi, Professor. Um, uh, thanks for your share. And um, may I ask you a question? As everything has their own origins and uh, is pure in their own ways. May I ask uh, where the dark energy and uh, dark matters come from? And uh, where will they go disappear in the future? Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. That's an excellent question. I think if I knew the answers, I would be walking to Stockholm right now. <laughs> but we don't actually know the origin of um, um, dark energy. What we know, we know the origin, we believe that the origin of dark matter is um, uh, in the very early universe. When all particles were created, we believe this exotic particle, if it's a whim for an axion or whatever, it was created at the same time. And in terms of the fate, again, we don't, a very, you've asked some really tough, tricky questions. 
These are at the forefront of research right now. So, you know, the fate of our universe is determined by the nature of dark energy and the origin of dark energy, which we don't know. So we don't know the fate either. So there are many possibilities, once again, for the fate of the universe. And the fate will be determined when we understand dark energy a little bit better. So all I can say is that um, you've really nailed some of the deeper questions that we are grappling with right now. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And, and, I'll, and I'll just add that uh, this is exactly why this field is so exciting, because there are so many questions where we don't know, um, and we're really brushing up against the intersection of science and philosophy here. Um, and really trying to, to grapple with what can we actually know. Um, I see that Yang raised his hand in the participant section. So let's call on him and have him uh, ask his question. Hi, Professor. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is uh, more practical, uh, is that um, from your lecture, I can imagine that there are a lot of uh, 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 because there are a lot of ob observational biases uh, that we need uh, a, uh, an awful lot of measures uh, to um, make them more um, objective as well as um, more um, objective in some senses. Uh, so that's why uh, you mentioned about the mapping and uh, uh, everything. Uh, and the second question is that, um, uh, what do you think of calendars uh, with the involvement of uh, uh, astronomy as well as uh, uh, all the satellites that's, that are distributed uh, for the Earth right now? Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Um, so once again, Devin, I am getting really good questions from everyone. Are you sure they are not all scientists who are like grilling me now? <laughs> they may be. <laughs> okay, right? And um, the, okay, so first the question about, you know, how reliable, I think he was trying to ask me how reliable are all these measurements and these claims that are being made about all these unseen quantities? That's an excellent question. And I think I mentioned it briefly in my talk. You know, when I talk, when I've mentioned the evidence, right, for each and every phenomenon that I've talked about, there are many independent lines of evidence. So that's why it's very robust and it's not a subjective interpretation of the data. It is really objective because many different independent ways are giving you the same conclusion, right? And that's why these quantities are, that's why I think it's reliable knowledge that you know, it's not uh, because of the independent uh, ways in which. And once again, also when we have data, one of the nice things about science, you know, science is very global, right? There are international teams everywhere, people collaborate. But often when we have a piece of data, many independent groups analyze it with their own software, their own tools, and then compare results. So the results that we are really sure of are the ones in which there is an alignment and convergence from many different independent lines. Your second question, I think, is about, um, you were talking about the satellites, right? So yes, we have a lot of satellites right now in space that, you know, of course, there are satellites that are looking down on Earth and mapping climate, mapping all of that, as well as the GPS satellites that are helping us map time. Um, I think that's what you were asking. And then we have these satellites that are looking out into the universe. So, you know, we have a lot of satellites that are looking out, some that are looking in, and the ones that are looking in are the GPS satellites that are giving us. Um, and I think where what you were trying to ask me was that, you know, in the GPS satellites, it is true that Einstein's theory of general relativity, which shapes our understanding of the universe, is relevant for GPS satellites for keeping time. For keeping accurate time, those satellites are important. And because they measure, they measure time. So they ping, they measure distances, they measure time with lasers and so on. But because they are in the gravitational field, they're looking above, 
we have to make some corrections. And there's a correction of 38 kind of microseconds that needs to be made. And you're right. So the accuracy we have had because of these satellites, now our timekeeping as well as mapping have become much more accurate. So very good questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, we've got another question here from HCQJ. I'm going to unmute. Hopefully they're able to ask the question. Yes, oh, hi, go ahead. Hi, Professor. Um, uh, yeah, I would like to know more uh, about the expansion and the, um, the accelerating universe that you were talking about. If we, I was wondering whether we know more about the rate of the acceleration or else how can we be able to estimate the, um, the age of the universe and also what does this result give us? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Once again, an excellent question. <laughs> so the expansion, um, you know, the expansion of the universe, we are talking about expansion of space. So the three coordinates of space. So time in our universe flows in one direction, and that has a constant rate at which time flows. So that's why we can measure the age of the universe from time elapsed. So the expansion of the universe uh, does not mean that time is actually expanding with it, right? So we measure time as uh, time elapsed, time from the Big Bang. So we set our clock, T equals zero at the Big Bang, and then, then we have been measuring time from that, from that then on. And that's why we know that the age of the universe is finite. And we know that from many, once again, as I said, many different independent kinds of measurements. We know that from, for example, the oldest, the age of the oldest stars that we can find. We know that the universe has to be older than that. So mm -hmm. that gives us a limit, right? So, and then we know from measurements of the very early universe, there was radiation. There was energy uh, from the very early universe that we measure today even a remnant of that relic radiation. And from the statistics of that relic radiation, we are able to say something about how, how long the universe has existed. So I think coming to your question about the acceleration and the, why is the acceleration important? The acceleration is important, as I told you, that the expansion is the expansion of space. And the acceleration tells you that the space is expanding at an accelerating rate, which is revealing to us that there is some unknown energy that the universe has that is powering, that is making that happen. And that's the energy that we call dark energy. We don't know what it is, as I said, we know what it does, but we don't know what it is. So our current best guess for what this dark energy might be we think it is a constant kind of push that has been given to the universe from the very beginning, but it was not dominant early on. It was very subdominant. It was very weak. And that as time has gone on, it has picked up strength. And this energy has become stronger and stronger more recently in the universe. And it has started pushing the accelerating expansion. OK, thank you. Welcome. If I could use my moderator's uh, privilege here and do a follow-up question on that. Um, I, I think you had mentioned something about the Big Bang Theory. Is um, Sort of the models that we have, does it kind of presume that the Big Bang Theory is true already and therefore we're mapping it out? Uh, or is there, what's, I guess what I'm saying is sort of based on the data, can we, how sure are we of the Big Bang Theory? I, I'm guessing by the fact that it's called a theory that it's a theory. <laughs> is, it, is it possible that it's wrong? And then I guess the other question is, uh, even if it is right, is it possible that it's the Big Bang moment was so different than everything else that we've experienced in time that it, everything behaved differently? 
Right, uh, great question. So I think there is incontrovertible evidence, once again, from many independent lines that the Big Bang happened. But you know, the word Big Bang is a bit of a misnomer. So let me just clarify. Right. The Big Bang sounds like it was a big firecracker, big explosion. No, the Big Bang was just T equals zero. It is the start of the universe. And the universe was basically very hot and very dense in the beginning. And when we talk about expansion, and so the Big Bang did not happen in one place. It's not like a firecracker. The Big Bang happened everywhere because that was the universe. The universe was everywhere. And that little everywhere has become everywhere now, the bigger expanded everywhere now. So the Big Bang did not, was localized in time, but not in space. It happened everywhere, right? I think your second question was, was there anything special about that moment? There was something special about that moment. Why? Because we don't know how to talk about, how to even think about what happened before it. So, and so we think, so, you know, Stephen Hawking introduced this notion that it is, uh, that the Big Bang is a singularity. A singularity just means that all our knowledge of laws of physics breaks down and then we don't know what happened. So yes, it is a special moment. It marks a special moment um, in the uh, life of the universe, absolutely. And do we have to account for the, the peculiarity of that when we do these models or how can we account for that? We can't, so the only thing we can do is we say, okay, we set the clock at t equals zero I don't know what happened before that. I can't make any, I can't make any predictions. I have no theory. I mean, I have theories. I have models. I have mathematical models that can kind of explain. And that's what string theory is doing, trying to come up with ideas before the Big Bang, right? But what we do know is that we set, once we set that to t equals zero, then we know all the initial conditions. We know that our universe, for it to be the way it is today, needs to have started from a hot, dense place, right? And we know that from just the, uh, what we see today. And then, as I mentioned, this relic radiation that we actually measure ratifies that picture. So that's sort of the, that's why, that's the evidence that backs it up, backs up the model. So, you know, the, you know people use the word theory in many different ways, or oh, it's not just a theory. This is a theory as in it's established and it has incontrovertible evidence supporting it. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Candy has oh, two can I, questions. Can I please oh. also follow up? Uh, yes. This is a quick. small question. Yeah. Sorry. Um, professor, you were talking about um, the Big Bang happening everywhere, and you were talking about there's a radiation. But uh -huh. um, my question would be that is the radiation the same everywhere? Does that, uh, does that just tes testify the theory then? Yes, this radiation is around us even today. It's in the microwaves. It's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. It started out very hot, but it cooled over time as the universe expanded. So we are bathed in this radiation. It is very, very uniform, but you can imagine that as this radiation is coming towards us, remember the universe is cooling, it's expanding, and galaxies are forming. So this radiation interacts with the galaxies. It goes through the galaxies and it carries the imprint of everything that it has encountered on its way to us. So this, this radiation is really uniform in temperature to the fifth decimal place. It's 2.32471 Kelvin. That's very cold, it's in the microwaves. But in the sixth decimal place onwards, it is different from point to point on the sky. And that's because there are, there are in some pathways, light, this is radiation is light, has in the microwave, has encountered a galaxy that has formed. Sometimes it hasn't. I mean, so you have light that is coming to us through the universe that sometimes has encountered something, balls of gas, balls of hydrogen, a star, a galaxy. And there are some, and you know, space is mostly empty, right? So some radiation has come right through. So, um, so there is a uniform temperature with a little bit of inhomogeneity. Thank That's you, thank you so much. Yeah. All right, next we have Candy.
You're still muted, Candy. There you oh, go. Oh, okay. Um, hi, Professor. Um, thank you for your lecture. And um, so I just have two questions. The first one is like, um, so um, we know that like the dark matter can produce a gravitational field and that um, that is like what holds together like a lot of the things that cannot be like otherwise explained by like the normal like gravity we can see. But then is it possible that the dark matter can also like produce other fields like electrical field like those? And um, also like um, for like the gravitational field and the electrical field, like do the, uh, like the normal laws that we assign to these fields like actually apply to dark matter because they're like a completely different kind of like atoms. And um, so one more question about the expansion of the universe is like, so um, if there's like, uh, so like the, as you said, the light is traveling. So um, there's like still a lot about the universe that we cannot yet see. Um, so would that like affect our prediction about the expansion of the universe? Because we don't yet know like what like the entire universe right now is like. Yeah. Great. No, great questions. Okay. So first, your first question about, um, so guess what? Dark matter has no charge. So the dark matter particle is not charged. So it doesn't interact with any other force. As I mentioned, it's only gravity because it has only mass. And what, when I said it's collisionless, right? So it doesn't even have pressure because remember you get pressure mm -hmm. only when you have collisions. So you have a gas that you put in a container, the molecules are hitting the container and that's why you have pressure. But if there's no hitting, there's no colliding, there's no pressure. So this dark matter is a very peculiar elementary particle, okay? So it has no charge and no magnetic field. So it doesn't interact with a magnetic field, no electrical charge. So we, we can't find it using any of those because it doesn't interact. So we have to find it only trying to use the gravity. So, um, so it feels only gravity. Then your next question was about the um, expansion of the universe. The, yeah. Is the, once again, is it the role of dark matter in it? Um, it's kind of like if we, um, like, if there's like still like not, um, like light not passing through like certain regions of the universe, um, then like, how can we like, how can we like distinguish between like, whether like the universe is expanding or just like, we see I more. I understand what you're asking now. So basically, look, everything, our cosmic messenger is light. All the information that we get from the universe is light, light of different wavelengths, microwave, visible light, x-rays, everything, the whole thing, right? So just as when you see our body with an x-ray, you no longer see the skin and you see the bones, you see a different view, right? So we see different views of the universe with a different light, right? And dark matter is not illuminated in any wavelength. We don't see it at all. But all the measurements that we make in the universe are of visible objects and their properties. And so the presence of dark matter, for example, in a galaxy is measured how? From the speeds of the stars that we do see. And they are moving too fast, right? So that's mm -hmm. how all the measurements in astronomy are done, basically. We measure only light and then we infer we then interpret that measurement in terms of what we don't see. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, just another really small question. So I saw that like in the uh, in the plot of like the planets in the solar system, um, you put like Pluto. So I was I, wondering <laughs> that you know I'm it's I'm, I have this childish thing that you know when I was a young girl. This is a long time ago now. I'm very old. You know, Pluto was still a planet. And so I can't give that up. You know, I can't give up the idea of nine planets, except you all must know that Pluto has been demoted, but we think there is a planet nine. We haven't found it yeah. yet. There's some evidence that may be a planet you now at the outer reaches of the solar system. Yeah, yeah it's just that like, uh, like in the recent book, like I read of like Mike Brown, like how I killed Pluto and why it had it coming. 
So, you know, I should mention, so, you know, I am on Twitter and my handle is Sheer Priya, S-H-E-E-R Priya. And his handle is Pluto. And we are constantly, he keeps telling me, you have to give up this fantasy, this childhood fantasy. It's like Santa Claus. You know, Pluto, like, I can't, I can't, I can't give it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Candy. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from somebody raising their hand, Xiao Wang. Oh, sorry. Hold on. I think I see a question from Lizzie. Uh, yes. We're, I'm kind of jumping between the two. Oh, okay. oh sorry. Can you? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. All right, thank you, Professor, for the, for the great talk. Uh, uh, my question is somehow related to uh, HCQJ's question. Uh, uh, when, you, when you mentioned that uh, the, the space expansion uh, is accelerated and uh, the time elapse stays the same rate, uh, but uh, uh, when, when we say space and time are like tied together, so the expansion acceleration of space doesn't change how fast time elapses. Is it does I understand it. The flow it. of time. The flow of time is um, is not impacted by the expansion of space. So when I say flow, I mean intervals of time, right? So what is the time elapsed, right? That doesn't change. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Uh, Lizzie, this question about entropy, but I'll see if Lizzie has anything else to add to that. Go ahead, Lizzie. Lizzie, are you there? All right. Well, maybe we'll wait to see if Lizzie comes back. <laughs> um, and then, so let's jump to Yi. Looks like he has some pretty detailed questions. Yeah, I see the questions. Um, are they there? Or... Ye, yeah, are I'm there. there. Yeah, great. Yeah, so, so I have two questions uh, just to uh, repeat them. One is just around dark energy. Um, whether you know, there's general acceptance that Higgs field um, is the uh, mechanism uh, through which uh, that we have dark energy or there are other uh, theories being put forward um, and the second one is um, I understand their efforts to show that inflation is not a definitive feature of Big Bang um, that there are other ways um, we can explain uh, anisotropy and, and flatness issues uh, I would just love to hear your thoughts on that Great. Uh, thanks, Yi. They're great questions. So the first one, actually, there um, the Higgs field is not really seen as the origin for dark energy. In fact, the um, the what is really believed is that somewhat maybe similar to a Higgs kind of mechanism, you could have some kind of scalar field, which is may or may not be related to the Higgs field. You know, the Higgs field that gives all um, matter, its masses, and so on. Uh, we believe that it could be something that is called the cosmological constant. It is the vacuum energy of the universe. The, you can think of it as the kind of, you know, just as a, a hydrogen atom has a ground state energy, that the universe has a baseline energy, and that that could be the uh, um, a possible explanation. It's called a cosmological constant. But you know, there is no consensus really. At the moment, it is consistent, as I mentioned, with the idea of having a fixed value throughout the age of the universe. Although it is not dominant in the early universe and it starts to pick up and get dominant in the late universe, but its value is fixed, it's constant. So that's the current kind of uh, understanding. As for your second question, you know, I think the issue about inflation is that nobody disagrees that our universe had to have had an inflationary stage. We believe, but the question is whether inflation as an idea and as a theory is actually falsifiable. So that's where there's the controversy in, uh, about inflation. So it is so generic 
that it's not clear that it's falsifiable. Like you absolutely have, you need it to explain the flatness of the universe and the anisotropies and the isotropy and the anisotropy of the microwave, cosmic microwave background that I was just mentioning. To mention both of those and to explain the origin of the initial conditions for, of what sets up the dark matter uh, from the start to give us all the structure that we see in the later universe. So for all of that, it looks like we need the generic theory of inflation. Yi, do you want to follow up on that or do you have further questions on that? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Uh, I mean, just one very quick follow up. Um, on the first question in terms of um, some mechanism um, that allows the um, vacuum energy to be released, um, what's the hypothesis around what triggered um, such a release of the vacuum energy? Or you're saying that it, it actually did not change, that this is something that has existed from the very beginning to, to the present moment? We, we think just like inflation, there was probably some kind of, you know, trans phase transition in a field that we call quintessence. So that scale of field is often called quintessence. And maybe it was a phase transition, just like for the field, that uh, inflationary scale of field. But, uh, you know, the word, basically what you need is you need um, this scalar field. And then it has, you know, what is called a vacuum expectation value. It has a web which is a constant, it's magnitude, if you will. And that is what we think sets up the cosmological constant. I mean, the reason I, it may sound a little wishy-washy from what I'm telling you is because the current understanding is wishy-washy. This constant that we infer from cosmology, that number is 0.7, okay? From all these particle physics arguments that we are talking about, you know, the field and the thing, you know, generating a phase transition and giving you, that number that particle physics give you is 10 to the power 30. So we don't know how to make 10 to the power 30 become 0.7. It's a kind of an embarrassing problem at the moment. So we don't, that's why, you know, I said we haven't been able to connect the particle physics of the early universe to what we see astronomically in our observations, what we need to interpret. There's a little bit of a disconnect there. So that's why we really don't know what's going on is the fair thing to say. Great, thank you. Uh, let's thank see you. if Lizzie is back on. Hi. Lizzie? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Um, you mentioned the universe is expanding and it is accelerating. So um, I've learned the theory of entropy. So um, does it have any connection between the expansion of universe and entropy? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Lizzie. I don't know what it is about all of you. You are all asking me the deepest questions, I have to say. So, you know, the, what we know is that entropy has a direction to it. Entropy is always increasing. And uh, that is a property of entropy. It's a fundamental thermodynamic property. And it is tied to the nature of time's arrow, the fact that time only goes forward. We can only go forward in time. That is tied to the fact that entropy can only increase, right? And it turns out an entropy is a measure of disorder, right, if you will, in a system the amount of messiness in the system. So it turns out that as the universe expands, because galaxies form, they form later, right? The messiness in the universe is also growing. So it happens that the entropy of the universe is increasing as we go forward in time, which is the only direction that we can go. But that's a great question. And it's a deep philosophical question as well. Thank you. Okay. Wow, so a lot <laughs> to digest. Um, 
for you guys in China, you have all day to think about this stuff. I will have to try to not think about this stuff so I can go to sleep. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. This was a fantastic talk and a fantastic uh, Q&A session. Uh, I'm going to unmute everybody so that everybody can thank the professor. And also, if you guys want to turn on your camera, finally, we can take a group picture, which is a very traditional Chinese thing to do um, at the end of events, is to take a group picture. So if you're willing, please uh, show, show yourself so we can take a, a group picture and also um, thank the professor. I just want to say thank you so much to all of you. I had fantastic questions and I had so much fun. And I hope I get to see more of you later on uh, in, um, at the end of July, early August. Yes, and I don't know how many of you are science majors, but I suspect quite a few of you were because, or at <laughs> least very deep thinkers. So thank you so much. That was so much fun. Yes, thank you everybody.